Now, welcome to part three of my rewrite of the Ahsoka series, a rewrite that if you haven't seen the first two parts of yet, you'll want to go back and check out before watching this one. Otherwise, you're likely going to be very lost and confused in regards to what's going on here. Links to both of those parts will be in the comments and description below or even on your screen right now to click on. And just a quick note or two before getting started and also to explain why it took so long to get this part out. It's been like three weeks since the last one. And well, that's because I was kind of debating with myself how much I wanted to hold true to the original version of the Ahsoka series. As I was working on this, I quickly realized some things, like going to a whole other galaxy, for example, they just seemed unnecessary and even cumbersome. And so I kind of went back to the drawing board and scrapped some of those ideas that I was going to go with and try to hold to that would have kept it more in line with what it had been and decided to, though yeah, I'm going to keep it similar in some ways. But I decided to just do what I felt was better overall for the story and yeah, I got rid of the other galaxy idea and put a few more things in here and took some out that I think or hope will just work better. I've also decided to rename this. I didn't really put much thought into it when I called it Dark Force Rising, which as a lot of you know is the name of a book. And so now I'm going to call it something generic like Call of the Dark Side. Anyway, without further ado, let's get back to the story. We're once again on Lothal, at what was once the site of a Jedi temple, but where all that remains of it now is a symbol on the ground, a sign of what once was, and still is, a powerful virgins in the Force. And it's a virgins that was being used or drawn upon by Ahsoka Tano as she tried to delve further into an ancient Night Sister device in the hopes of finding a way to a planet where she believed the long-lost Ezra Bridger just might be. But now, an unconscious Ahsoka lays upon that symbol, her mind and or spirit trapped in the device that has been taken by Balin and Shin. And as we look down from above at Ahsoka laying upon the symbol, we see Sabine Wren all but stumble into the picture, wincing in tremendous pain and looking almost a little delirious as she collapses at Ahsoka's side. And she's grasping at where her hand once was, it having been removed by Shin in a lightsaber duel that saw her, Sabine, not only completely outmatched, but her saber, the one that once belonged to Ezra Bridger, taken from her. Also entering the frame with a slight kink in his mechanical step after being force pushed away by Balin is the droid Huyang, who looks down at Sabine or where her hand once was and says, we must immediately get you to a med center. But Sabine fiercely shakes her head and says through clenched teeth, what about Ahsoka? I won't just leave her like this. And you said if we moved her away from the virgins, if we did that, she may never find her way back to her body. The droid's head lowers a bit as he says, I'm not so sure how much it matters now that the device is gone. Anger and guilt now mix with the pain on Sabine's face as she shouts back, But it may still help, right? She may be able to use the Force in order to get herself out of there, right? And back to us. With the Force, anything is possible. That's what you said. Anything is possible. Hu Yang lifts his head, seemingly trying to look a bit more optimistic as he responds, Yes, yes, of course you're right. Though I must say, this situation is unlike any I have encountered before in all my time around the Jedi. Sabine shakes her head, both defiant and angry, but before she can say anything else, a few quick beeps seems to come from Hu Yang, and he says to her, We have an incoming transmission from General Hera Sundula. Sabine groans and then quickly folds her arms, trying to hide the fact that she has a missing hand, and simultaneously trying to erase all the pain from her face. Hu Ying looks rather perplexed by this, and so Sabine says to him, I don't need her worrying about me, not when we have bigger problems right now. She finishes by glancing down at Ahsoka, and Hu Ying responds, Perhaps the general can send us some medical, but Sabine cuts him off and says, I'll be fine. Hu Ying seems taken aback before saying, I've always been under the impression missing appendages were a big deal, a big painful deal for biological life forms. Sabine sighs and responds, I, I just, I don't need her trying to be Hera right now, trying to tell me what's best, always looking out for me. I can handle this. Hu Yang doesn't seem to understand that or know what to say, but then mutters something about the illogical nature of biological life forms, which is when more quick beeps are heard indicating the incoming transmission is still waiting. Sabine then nods at Hu Yang, trying again to erase the pain from her face, and a moment later a bluish life-sized hologram of Hera appears before them. And upon seeing Sabine, and despite her best efforts, Hera instantly seems to know something is wrong, and even asks, What's happened? Sabine groans before saying, We were attacked by a pair of Force users, and they took the map. 
With a frown forming on her face, Hera says, let me guess, they had lightsabers, orange lightsabers? Sabine looks a bit baffled, but nods her head and responds, yeah, how did you know that? Hera says back, because we just got word that a couple days ago two force users with lightsabers attacked a prison transport ship, killed some of the crew, locked up the rest, and all to free, and only free, Morgan Elsbeth. Hera then glances around the area a bit at whatever she's able to see being transmitted, and then asks, where's Ahsoka? Sabine then sighs deeply before looking down at Ahsoka and saying, that's a great question. Next thing we know, we're with Ahsoka as she, seemingly aimlessly by the sort of lost expression on her face, as she walks through a rather narrow, winding ravine with tall, jagged rock faces on both sides of her. A reddish sky far overhead that gives a red hue to everything around her. Sitting upon her shoulder, looking as forlorn as Ahsoka, is the colorful convor known as Morai. And after watching her traverse the ravine for some time, a look of despair growing on her face, we see the sort of path she's been following make a sharp turn, and right into a dead end, right into a sheer rock face, leaving her no way to go but back the way she came, or somehow up, which she seems to briefly consider as she glances that way with a frown on her face. Out of frustration then, Ahsoka makes a fist and softly bangs it into the stone wall and mutters to the convor, How long do you think we've been in here? From behind her then comes a rather pleasant sounding female voice that says, Longer than you even realize, for time in here is a funny thing. As Ahsoka quickly spins around, the convor springs from her shoulder and takes to the sky, letting out a few sort of startled screeches as it does. However, Ahsoka's attention remains fixed on the white-robed figure some twenty paces before her now, a tall, rather beautiful figure with pale skin, long, dark hair streaked with silver, and very large, intense green eyes. In her hand is a long, slender staff with a loop at the end, the same staff the near-skeletal figure from before was holding onto, the one that told her to look into the fire which led her here. This white-robed figure then continues, and you may find it rather difficult to escape from this place now, Ahsoka says. Why? What's happened? The figure lowers her head a bit, as if what she's about to say saddens her to some degree. Your friend had the telecor taken from her. The what? Ahsoka responds, and the white-robed figure explains. The device you found within the temple. It's a creation of my people. One normally used as a sort of prison for the misguided as a place to trap one's fire as a form of punishment, a place for them to spend a great deal of time reflecting. Ahsoka, her hands out at her sides in a non-threatening manner, then takes a couple hesitant steps towards her and says, So you were put in here as punishment? The white-robed figure shakes her head and says, No, I chose this fate. I allowed my fire to be placed in here. Ahsoka takes more steps forward and says, Your fire? The white-robed figure seems surprised that Ahsoka doesn't understand what she's talking about and says, Are you not one who can feel its warmth and even wield it? Are you not familiar with the fire? The one we all possess within us? The one that makes us what we are? Unites us all? Ahsoka then says, The Force. You're talking about the luminous beings we truly are. To that, the white-robed figure gives a bit of a shrug and says, If you prefer... She then raises her hand, and in the palm of it is a small green flame, though those who call it the Force tend to misunderstand much about its true nature, its true purpose. Ahsoka smirks and seems like she could have a thing or two to say about that, but instead says, You said my friend had the telecord taken from her. Is she okay? The white-robed figure looks almost amused, or maybe even surprised, as she says, how curious that your concern for her outweighs the concern for yourself. That amused a look then almost becomes sadness, and her eyes start to become distant, as if staring into the past, as she says, Though I suppose I can understand putting another before the self. Ahsoka takes a few more steps forward and says, Your sister, you mentioned something about her before. Ahsoka's eyes shift to what's in her hand now, to the staff that the skeletal figure from before held, and she continues, or, at least I assume that was you from before. The figure seems to consider how responding before saying, That was another part of me. A part of me that has become something different in this place. As for my sister, the figure's face grows ever more distant and lost in another time and place before she continues. My sister, I've been 
waiting for her call, waiting to guide her home. A part of me is always reaching out to her. Will aid any that seek to help her finally make her way back. Ahsoka then asks, Guide her home from where? Do you mean the world at the end of the map we found in this... Telecor? But the figure doesn't answer. Instead, she seems to be too deep in thought, seeing a past that clearly haunts her. Ahsoka takes yet another step or two towards her and says, Please, tell me about your sister, about where she's gone. I think... I think a friend of mine may have been taken to the same place, and he's someone who'd also very much like to come home. The white-robed figure seems to snap back to reality, and as she does, she now looks beyond Ahsoka and says, They have found us here. The last bastion of my sanity, the last place of serenity I had left to me, has been breached. Ahsoka then follows her eyes and sees that behind her, slowly emerging from the rock face, are green night sister spirits, angry, spiteful looks upon their face, as if none too pleased about what is being discussed here. Rather instinctually, Ahsoka's hands then drop to her side, taking hold of her lightsabers that, thankfully, seem to be with her in this vision or whatever it truly is. Who exactly are they? She then asks, igniting them. The white robe figure responds, Servants of my sister, who also willingly entered, to make sure I never changed my mind and tried to abandon my duty, to abandon my promise to her. The look on her face becomes almost bitter as she continues, speaking more to herself than anything. How could she ever question my loyalty? How could one I gave everything to, who made me all that I am, think I would ever turn my back upon them? Something about those words seem to resonate, and not in a good way, with Ahsoka. As she then takes a few steps back and away from the spirits and towards the white-robed figure, she then asks, How do I get to the world at the end of the map? But the white-robed figure shakes her head and says, It's impossible without the telecore to guide you. It can act in reverse, as a sort of beacon to where she has gone. There can be no other way through the barrier, unless... She leaves that hanging, and Ahsoka, as more spirits emerge from the rock walls and begin to move towards her, asks, Unless what? The white-robed figure responds, We have no more time here, nor do we have all that we would need anyway. Seek out what's left of me on Dathomir. What's left of you on Dathomir? Ahsoka repeats as if she must have heard wrong. She frowns and then says, But isn't your, uh, fire in here? Besides, how am I just supposed to find you there? It's a big world, in case you've forgotten. Once more, the white robe figure opens up her hand, and in the palm of it is again the green flame. Take it, is all she says. Ahsoka's frown only grows as she stares at the flame and wonders what exactly she's supposed to do. Take it. Take the only part of me left that is still me. The only part that hasn't been eroded away by all the time I've spent in this place. My time waiting to keep a promise I knew deep down I should have never made. But how do you say no to the one who believed so much in you? The figure then motions with her head towards the flame in her hand, and after hesitating for a few more seconds, a few more seconds that the spirits get closer, Ahsoka turns off one of her sabers and puts her hand over the flame and ever so briefly winces in pain, as if literally being burnt by it. A moment later, there is a green flash in her eyes, and she removes her hand, and the flame is gone. Great, now how do I get out of here? Ahsoka then takes a moment to lunge at and swing her sabers at and through some of the Night Sister spirits. Worth a shot, she grumbles to herself. The white-robed figure then says, Where you were, that world, that place upon it, the fire was strong there, powerful. You can still use that strength, draw upon it, to help you get back, but you will need to be guided. Ahsoka gives something like a helpless shrug and says, Any suggestions on how I do that? We are all the fire. We are all part of it. Reach out to something familiar, to someone familiar, and then seek me out on Dathomir. Return what's left of my fire. And even if I can never bring my sister home, perhaps I can help you find your friend and bring him home. Despite the spirit still closing in, almost being upon her now, Ahsoka shuts her eyes and tries to calm herself and steadies her breathing. She mutters one word, almost like she's calling out to them. Sabine. She then says that name another time or two, but nothing seems to happen. Just as the spirits reach her and are about to surround and potentially consume her, she says another name. Anakin. And this time, this time, she disappears. We're then back on Lothal, at the site of the former temple once more, where we see a sun rising on the horizon, and where we also see that Ahsoka is still laying upon the symbol, a warm blanket now covering her, with Sabine sitting nearby, looking utterly exhausted, but with eyes still just barely being kept open, her missing hand injury having been tended to now, some sort of mechanical device or cap-like device having been placed over it. We then see, despite her best efforts, Sabine's eyes close, and while we can only assume dreaming, 
We see Sabine walking down the corridor of what appears to be a Star Destroyer, and there are warning alarms blaring over and over again as if the ship is perhaps under attack. We then see her approach some double doors that slide open when she gets close enough to them, revealing the bridge of what is indeed a Star Destroyer. And at the far end of it, looking out the large viewport at what seems to be a green and blue planet that the ship is in orbit above, is a figure turned away from her, one in a white imperial uniform with their blue hands clasped behind their back. Sabine's face contorts into anger as she charges forward at it, her hand going to her side as if looking for a weapon, but she finds none there, and when she reaches him, the figure simply turns around calmly, and instead of being Thrawn, it's Ezra. But he has glowing red eyes and is wearing a Grand Admiral's uniform. He then says to her, Looking for this? As he holds up his lightsaber, the lightsaber she lost to Shin. Ezra then slowly shakes his head like he's disappointed and says, I can't believe you let her take it from you. And then the map, too. I just can't believe how weak you are. How did I ever think you'd be able to find me? How was I dumb enough to think you'd ever be able to save me? Ezra then shakes his head and sighs before continuing, I should have known better. This is my fault. I should have known you'd fail me. Just like you failed when you made a weapon that killed your own people. I mean, who would ever do that? Sabine now shakes her head too and says, No, we stopped that. We... Ezra ignores her and turns around and looks out the viewport again, where the blue and green planet from before has been replaced by a world where we see massive explosions all across its surface. That's when, horrified, Sabine whispers, Mandalore. Ezra just shrugs rather carelessly as he looks on and says, Eh, I guess it didn't really matter either way, did it? Most of your people are still dead and gone, and those left are scattered and leaderless. Ezra then taps at his chin, looks like he's trying to recall something, and then says, and wasn't it you that gave away the one thing that could unify them? Didn't you give the Darksaber to Bo-Katan? Isn't this, then, all your fault, too? Isn't what happened to Mandalore on you? Isn't all that blood on your hands, the hands of a coward who refused to step up and lead when she was called to? Ezra then laughs at himself and says, My apologies, I should say on your hand, am I right? Sabine turns away from the bombing of Mandalore and from Ezra and says, this isn't real. You're not really him. You're not Ezra. Ezra, or what appears to be him, then says, You're right. I'm not him. But I do know where he is. And I can help you find him and bring him home. I can help you finally do something right, Sabine. I can help you at least not completely fail every single person you've ever known and cared about. And I won't even ask for all that much in return. Sabine then jolts awake, most likely woken by Ahsoka beginning to stir, and as Ahsoka's eyes begin to flutter open, the look of dread on Sabine's face, brought on by the nightmare or vision or whatever exactly it was, it's washed away. It's all washed away and forgotten about, for the moment, by a wave of absolute relief. Sabine then says, You made it back. Ahsoka, looking rather groggy like she's trying to get her wits about her, sits up and places a hand on the side of her head and says, what did I miss? Huyang then chimes in. Quite a bit, actually. Sabine then holds up her arm and shows Ahsoka the missing hand. Yeah, we're all missing quite a bit. Ahsoka looks shocked and is clearly about to ask what happened when Sabine says, They were force users of some kind. Far more than I was ready for, that's for sure. And they took... they took the map. Sabine's eyes then narrow in anger as she says, One of them also took Ezra's lightsaber. And it also seems as if they may have been the ones who freed Morgan Elsbeth. Ahsoka's eyes widen in surprise and horror. Morgan has been freed? Sabine nods. Hera contacted us about it. She's on her way here now, in fact. Sabine looks all around her, at the nothingness around her, and says, How do you think they ever found us here? How did they know the device was here of all places in the galaxy? Ahsoka thinks for a long moment and says, It must have called out to Morgan. The sister, she said... Part of her would always reach out to those willing to aid her sister, which means... Ahsoka thinks for another long moment, all the while Sabine looks more confused than ever. Finally, Ahsoka continues, Morgan might just be after something more than finding and bringing Thrawn back. Ahsoka looks into Sabine's eyes and then says, This changes everything. But Sabine shakes her head angrily. No, that changes nothing. We're bringing Ezra home, just like you promised him. I'm not failing him too. Ahsoka shuts her eyes and sighs. Of course I want to see Ezra come home, Sabine. Of course I do. But now we must proceed with even more caution than before. 
We have no idea what we're dealing with here, and Thrawn cannot be forgotten about either. Sabine, looking beyond frustrated, then says, Does it really even matter anyway? I lost the device. Ahsoka then responds, We're not going to give up hope. We made a copy of the map, right? We know where they want to go, and thus we may yet be able to stop that from happening. Also, I may yet know a way to get us through the barrier and to where Ezra is. Sabine then says, I'll do whatever I have to to find him and bring him home. Which doesn't seem to be exactly what Ahsoka was hoping to hear, but she says anyway, We're not going to give up on finding Ezra, but we won't dishonor his sacrifice either. We won't risk countless lives to bring him home. That's not what he would want, and you know it. Sabine sighs and finally reluctantly nods her head, which is when they all look up and see a New Republic shuttle escorted by four X-Wings quickly approaching their position. Next thing we know, we're taken into that shuttle as are Sabine, Ahsoka, and Hu Yang, where we also find Hera. All four of them stand around a small, hollow projector table, where, being projected upon it, are images of Balin and Shin taken of them during their liberation of Morgan Elsbeth. We then hear Hera say, no records of them exist anywhere, not in the New Republic database, or even in all the Imperial records we've recovered. It's then Hu Yang who speaks up and says, I do believe I may know one of them, assuming the lightsaber he wields now is the same one he constructed a great many years ago as a youngling. Ahsoka then asks, you think he's a former Jedi, an Order 66 survivor? Hu Yang's head bobs up and down. Indeed, Balin Skull was his name. Ahsoka shakes her head, clearly never having heard of him or remembering him. Hu Yang then continues, If that name isn't familiar to you, then perhaps the name of his master will be Meldra Hesfark. It takes Ahsoka a moment, but by her surprised reaction, the name is clearly familiar, and she repeats it as if in complete disbelief. Hu Yang then says, I thought you might indeed find that rather interesting. Sabine looks from Ahsoka to Hu Yang back to Ahsoka and finally says, are you going to clue the rest of us in? Ahsoka, still clearly a little lost in thought, simply says, Meldra was a Gorthelian. Every youngling in the temple used to be all but terrified of her. Sabine stares blankly for a moment, then says, Believe it or not, I'm not familiar with every single species in the galaxy. Ahsoka gives an almost apologetic smile, frees herself from her memory, and explains, Their world has been declined membership to the Republic numerous times over the centuries for, shall we say, having very strict and harsh laws to the point where even just stealing something as simple as a Meluron could result in a punishment as severe as death. Sabine looks stunned and mutters, and I thought we Mandalorians could be strict. Ahsoka then continues, They're also one of the few known species in the galaxy just naturally gifted with the Force. Most of their kind have the ability to tell when others are being deceptive, to see truth above all else. It's made them, shall we say, difficult to deal with for most other species. Though generally they keep to themselves, to their homeworld, even the Jedi tended not to accept them into the Order for their all too often lack of compassion. But Meldra was a rare case of one being allowed in. Hu Yang then adds, I met her only once, during the gathering, and dare I say her stare was colder than the winds of Ilum. It's Hera then who asks, Why let a Jedi like that have a Padawan? Ahsoka gives a bit of a grin and responds, Jedi don't always get to pick when and what Padawan they get. Usually, yes, it's all up to them, but sometimes they'll pair up a master and an apprentice who can learn a thing or two from each other. Sabine then says, So Balin was paired with this ice Jedi because why? Hu Yang then responds, Balin was an extremely gifted student, but a bit unruly, wild even. He was taken in at a slightly older age than most are, after being found in the lower levels of Coruscant, where he'd been abandoned by his parents. So what, Sabine begins to ponder aloud, but the troublemaker with the overly strict Jedi and hope it helps both of them? Ahsoka nods, likely something just like that was the idea. Ahsoka then lets out a sigh as she again looks at the hollow image of them and continues, and now the question is, why is he helping Morgan, and who is the apprentice? Hu Yang then says, as Master Mundi used to say, start by considering the easy explanation first, and the simplest one is always... Ahsoka then finishes for him, the simplest one is always a selfish one. She then thinks another moment and says, could it be as simple as greed? He wants credits and Morgan is quite wealthy and he doesn't care what he has to do or who he has to hurt to get them? 
It's Sabine who then says, he didn't exactly strike me as that type. Hera and Ahsoka give her a questioning look, and Sabine explains, looking at Ahsoka, he could have easily killed you if he wanted to, but he didn't. And she, Sabine says all but spitting out the words as she looks at the hollow image of Shin, she would have killed me if it wasn't for him stopping her. Ahsoka's eyes then narrow on Shin as she says, Maybe she's the answer then. Maybe whatever he's doing is for her sake. After all, some masters will do nearly anything for their apprentice. It's then that we're taken across the galaxy to a room in a ship somewhere out there in space where Balin and Shin stand side by side looking out a window at seemingly nothing but the stars. It's Shin who then says, The call is getting louder. Balin nods his head and says, Yes, it is. We're close now. Shin shakes her head, looking almost mad, and says, Why must we heed its call, Master? Why heed the call of anything but our own hearts, our own wants and desires? Isn't true power being free of the whim of others? Balin gives her a gentle, rather fatherly look, and says, Even the fiercest hunter must go where the prey leads. Shin gives a confused look, clearly not understanding, so Balin explains, We do not heed its call, Shin. We go simply because that is where it is where the power we know belongs to us is. Shin responds, How can you be so sure it'll be that simple? Why would it invite us in only to be defeated and have its power taken? What if what we think is the prey is actually the hunter leading us into a trap? Balin seems to consider that for just a moment before asking, What have the visions always shown you? Shin shuts her eyes as if seeing and remembering them and says with a scowl still on her face, I always defeat her and take the power as my own always. Balin nods and says, and do you think this vision is a trick of the one who calls out to us, or is it instead a vision of clarity, a vision of your destiny granted by the force? Shin then says with a wicked smile on her face, it is my true destiny, I feel it, I know it. She's then quiet for a moment before saying, but what I don't understand is, why do the visions never show me you? Why are you not at my side for our great victory? It's then that behind that ever-present anger on her face, that there is just a trace of something else, a trace of concern. To that, though, Balin only smiles as if she's perhaps being silly and says, Fear not, Shin. In my visions, I'm always there, right behind you, and I would have it no other way. The look of concern seems to fade somewhat from Shin's face as she again goes back to simply looking out the window, not seeing the stars, but rather seeing her destiny and also not seeing the look on Balin's face, the look of a man who also sees his destiny, a different one from hers. And that is where this part ends. Well, that's all I got for you this time. Now it's your turn to take to the comments below and tell me what you thought of this part of the story, or tell me what you think is going to happen next. Whatever you choose to do, leave those comments below then. Let's talk some Star Wars, and until next time, thanks for watching.